welcome. If you just bear with me a second and I'll just get the details off. Okay, so we are in the um, Zoom meeting um, format today. So this means that as, you, as you're aware, um, your camera and microphone are available. Um, if you would not like to be seen, we do request that um, you turn your camera off and only turn your mic on when speaking. Um, it is preferred whilst um, Warren is delivering the presentation, just so that we can see him um, delivering the presentation on the screen. So if you could just um, turn your cameras off whilst um, that's taking place, that would be helpful, thank you. Um, you do also have the chat function um, available, which we can use to share any links or any information that might be um, useful. And if you prefer to um, ask a question in that um, format as well. Um, you do also have the option to um, use your um, raised hands. So if you do have a question, then please do um, use that and then we will come to your questions. Um, in terms of expectations, um, we'd like to thank you for attending the event and um, we hope you find it interesting and useful. Um, we do encourage participation and invite you to use the um, functions that have been mentioned. Um, just in terms of the chat, we just do request that you don't disclose any personal or confidential information um, about yourself. And um, we want to thank you again for participating um, in this event and our hands over now. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, welcome everyone again to this February Talking Head Seminar Series. Thanks for joining us today. And today's um, talk will be presented by Warren and um, I will hand over to Warren. But as Elena just explained, if you have any burning questions, please write in on the chat. And once Warren's um, presentation is finished, then we will open it for discussion and question and answer sessions, okay? So now over to you, Warren. Thanks, Mahir, and, and, and thanks everyone for coming along and, and sharing your time with me to talk about my thesis. I'll just pull it up onto the screen. Can everyone see that? We can, we can see the presentation, Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Warren Smith. I'm uh, senior social work lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, and I'm also doing my studies at Wolverhampton through the social policy department at ICRD. My thesis is called Devolving Democracy and it's a governance analysis of local economic and health and wellbeing partnerships in Sandwell. And what I intend to do this afternoon is just provide an overview of that in the context of devolution and provide some explanation of what governance networks are and their implications for democratic accountability. <clears throat> the study is taking place in Sandwell. Um, I think the catalyst for me becoming, well, there was a number of reasons why, why I wanted and why I chose to do this study. Um, there's a, I'm heavily laden with bias because I'm from the black country and I've experienced the black country go through lots of socioeconomic changes, certainly from when I was a young man in the late 1970s, early 1980s, really. But also um, through engaging with the students in the sociology classes and social policy classes where we scrutinize the data and approximately 70% of our students come from the um, immediate vicinities, a large chunk of them from the black country. And as they're engaging with the data, we're talking in class about what it is that they discover. Um, Sandwell is fairly, it mirrors pretty much the other three black country MBCs regarding population size and with broader sort of demograph. It makes no difference. And this is what the students discover when they look at their own areas. It makes no difference whether you're looking at public health data, NOMIS data, trends data. It all indicates the same thing that since roughly 2010, social economic well-being has actually worsened. Everything points downwards. So if you look at the ONS data, you can actually see that there are more people 
experiencing unemployment. It depend, depends which sort of statistics and which data you use, um, <clears throat> but um, experiencing issues with housing, with education and with health, and all of this impacts their well-being. So it's just trying to make the links between that sort of data and people's lived experiences and what the plans are um, for engaging with that and trying to build um, a more equal black country, a black country that's just a, a, an overall better place to live, really. I became incredibly interested with the industrial plans that um, since 2010, the government have been publishing, particularly how they pertain to the black country area, what those plans are and yeah what it is they intend to do with this building a bigger better stronger bolder economy because there's a debt now i mean a heavy um wealth of data and reports and literature that suggests if you really want to build that better bolder stronger economy then you need to actually consider the kind of broader environments where people are situated and where they live so going back to thinking about people's housing, their access to education, healthcare, good employment opportunities, safer spaces, access to green, envir you know, green environments, thinking about all of those things that actually they're intrinsically linked to building a better economy. So in 2000, 2017 and 2018, pre-pandemic, I attended um, two local enterprise partnerships, the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnerships conferences held at the Hawthorns. It was probably the Hawthorns in West Bromwich at the time, which was the main pull for me. But I was really interested in what they had to say and what their intentions were and, and how the kind of the synthesis between building that stronger economy and how that links to, you know, building that better sort of um, safer, greener, um, space that we'd all we, you know we'd all choose to live in it's then when i started looking at this and started scoping the literature i'll become aware of just how um complex the policy is this is a really crude diagram that kind of explores <clears throat> well explains rather the relationship between the local the regional and central government um i'll, I'll come on to discuss the health and well-being boards and the local enterprise partnerships in a little bit more detail shortly but in essence um historically the uk has had a heavily centralized form of state and government so that most policy most um, directives most decision making takes place in london and westminster unlike perhaps germany france and other countries we're gradually moving towards a more um, regionalized form of governance, but this isn't the first time that this has happened. There's a long history, almost in fact, um, you can go back to the 1920s, so almost 100 years of trying to reconcile the reality that um, the Southeast and London has much greater economic power and access to opportunity. That's not to say that poverty doesn't exist in those areas, because it certainly does, but has um, is more of um, an economic engine and powerhouse compared to other sort of further flung corners of the UK. National assistance was rolled out in 1920s uh, because of um, the onset of difficulties in certain types of industry, particularly mining, affecting South Wales, the Midlands, areas of the Northeast. Um, we've had urban development corporations through the 1980s, regional development agencies that structured in regional tiers of governance because government couldn't manage and couldn't commit to actually having a greater effect at a local level. What we currently have, we still have central government, we now have um, combined authorities. So the authority I'm most interested in is the West Mids Combined Authority that um, <clears throat> has a responsibility and a relationship to the local authorities, the five local, seven local authorities that it supports.
but also to the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership, which is situated to drive economic well-being. There's really strong arguments for devolution. The current mantra is about levelling up, so that disparity between the southeast and, and you know, the further flung corners and other, other areas of the country for actually um, creating um, a greater economic sort of balance. Um, another, another argument that's been around since sort of like the sort of mid 1970s really is that there is too much power in Westminster that actually <clears throat> functioning effective regional tiers will offer much more access to better services, better social capital, people become more politically energised and play a part in decision making at a regional and a local level. Another argument is the government just can't deliver anymore, it can't deliver from the centre. Um, this is particularly the case uh, with marketisation and the involvement of a whole raft of sort of private bodies that actually power from um, the centre has, has dissipated, has become weaker and weaker. Government, government can't possibly steer from the centre when it involves so many, the market and so many other sorts of agencies. Again, going back to <clears throat> recognising and utilising local knowledge that local people know their area and they're best placed to play a more active and vital role in decision making and respond to local needs particularly around community participation and actively involving residents in decision-making. The government itself, uh, particularly the Labour government in the early 90s, really started hitting home that local people needed to play a more active part in decision-making um, in their local areas. That could be decision-making at a very community level, um, around service provision, but also for the plans and visions for the area and how they build their own, um, yeah, their own localities and what they want them to look like. This in itself would build social capital and help create sustainable communities where people feel connected, where they feel involved, where they feel their voices are heard, listened to and acted upon. And also then to develop um, more inclusive growth, which always seems like a bit of an oxymoron to me, but um, a growth in the way that residents would choose for that growth to be. There's a big thing at the moment around capital extraction, where businesses, very often retail parks, consist of businesses that come, pay minimum wage or feed into the gig economy and yet extract lots of capital from those communities without effectively investing in them. It's beyond the scope and range for me to discuss this in any more depth, but there's lots of discussion there around the Preston model and how some of the um, authorities in Greater London are looking at that. And in fact, even Wolverhampton and Sandwell authorities are looking at the Preston model and seeing how communities can support and how they can support local businesses that employ local people and serve the local populace. There are also risks to devolution, okay? Fundamentally, the economic growth is given prominence over everything else. And just as I was discussing a few moments ago, um, there's a, a, a wealth of literature, a strong body of literature that says, you know, you can't just discuss economic growth in unison. You have to consider it in the context of people's well-being. There's always been, since the 1920s, a national assistance, this tension between government appearing to give powers to local communities, but actually still steering, still steering, still holding the reins through rewards, sanctions, access to funding, through, um, you know, uh, delegated legislation and guidance, which, which tells bodies, this is what you must do. Um, the hollow state come from Rod Rhodes and Marsh, where they said that they're actually because of neoliberalism, because of marketization, the state is becoming increasingly small and has far less clout. It is reliant upon the relationship that it has with the market. And as the market develops more power, so the market itself begins to steer. Um, there's also some developing research that, that suggests that actually power relations can just become amplified at the local level, whereas actually devolution 
unwittingly, or it could be contrived, allows more local elites to actually take power from those that just exist in the center. So it's just handing power from one elite to another. And what I'm particularly interested in as well is about participation and that kind of arcs back to what I was talking about a short while ago, is about how communities and how local uh, people are involved in decision-making. This was the plan that came around in 2017 and it was suggested that this would be the plan for the following 10 years. This is the government saying that this is what we want to do with our economy, but actually by building a stronger economy, we're gonna actually build much better living standards for people and provide much better opportunities. And also embedded in the um, industrial strategy is um, like a conduit for linking with communities. So communities can actually play an active part and join boards and have a say. It, it, it does talk to giving communities a strong voice. There is some critique of that because what the government has done is when they talk to community, it's unclear whether they're mentioning community in the terms that some of us might, might understand is about people actually inhabiting a local geographic space or whether they're talking to business community. So there is some confusion about that. It almost feels sometimes you don't know exactly which community this paper is talking to. However, this paper has very rapidly now been sort of um, transferred into the Build Back Better, which has most recently been published. Within the Build Back Better for Growth, because my studies are acting in, in real time, this is just a, another document for me to familiarise myself with, but I've scoped it and scanned it and although it talks about improving everyday life for communities, there's no real clear roadmap of how it does that. And not only is there no clear roadmap of how it does that, it doesn't clearly state how it's expecting the regional tiers and the local tiers to act upon that. So it almost feels like it's just a wedge and another, yet another plan of which there's an absolute plethora. <clears throat> now, my study. The context is what we've been discussing, really, devolution and um, power being um, sort of cascaded down to the regional tiers. My focus is on Sandwell, and particularly I'm focusing on two boards which carry significant weight and power at a local level. That's Sandwell Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, Sandwell Health and Wellbeing Board is a statutory committee that um, is empowered or given the responsibility rather to ensure that the local populace has access to good services and to raise the health and well-being of the of that local area. Health and well-being boards consist of a whole raft of different people, people from education, from universities, from health, uh, the police, local fire services, any statutory service really can, can be the member of a health and well-being board and it's to steer um, and to plan the visions for improving the health of those local areas. Also community membership and third sector involvement is absolutely vital to these boards. I can say with Sunwell that they have membership. Um, yep, and that's their function. The Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership. The Local Enterprise Partnerships, um, they came into the being that, 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 that as they are now, um, in 2010, and they've developed further powers through devolution deals, deals that, the stat, that the government has had with the regional tiers, and that the regional tiers have given to the Black Country Local Enterprise and the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnerships and other um, enterprise partnerships. They carry significant weight. Um, they're led by uh, business leaders. That the majority of their members are key business leaders in the Black Country. They have access to. Uh, millions of pounds of funding. Now, the MBCs straddle both of these agencies, okay? Um, they, they are um, a prominent force on both the Health and Wellbeing Board and on the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership too. So they have a responsibility to oversee and ensure that both of these boards, both of these bodies function. There's been significant reports published that say both of these boards should work uh, together. 
that they should coalesce and that they should structure their activities side by side to present a coherent um, vision for the local areas. What I've learned is, and this uh, just through the course of my studies, is that this is an absolute, you know, significant, enormous, monumental challenge for uh, people on the Health and Wellbeing Board, but also the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership. If you can imagine, the majority of the members on the Health and Wellbeing Board are uh, their, their backgrounds are health, education, the third sector, and similarly, the people on the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership are uh, the business leaders. They're local industrialists. They're people who've been incredibly successful in their fields of expertise. And in the absence of real clear guidance of how you dovetail these two bodies to actually build these plans so they can work alongside, well, that's been incredibly difficult. There are some statutory responsibilities to able, enable them to do that. But um, in all the interviews I've undertaken, which I'll come on to shortly, there's no evidence that actually there's been um, proactive meetings or a kind of um, space created for people to actually come along and share their vision, share their minds and share their working processes and processes and protocols. In the absence of that, what you have is a really confused um, local policy terrain. The local government publishes corporate plans. The um, Health and Wellbeing Board publishes a vision statement. Lo Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership has a, has a vision statement for the region. The Health and Wellbeing Board publishes um, a JSNA, which states that over the next year, this is our intention. These are the problems that we're tackling, tackling with regards to housing, education, health, and these are our intentions, and this is what we help aim to do. You have a health and wellbeing strategy that's published by the Health and Wellbeing Board and the local government that says that over the next three years, these are our intentions, and this is what we're going to do to make Samwell a better place and raise people's aspirations. You've got the industrial strategy, you've now got the plan for growth, and you've also got local economic, economic delivery plans. In a perfect world, these plans would harmonise, would talk with one another, and make perfect sense. From my own findings through the documentary analysis from which I've been undertaking, that's not the case. There's actually lots of conflicting and confused messages. And this is echoed through the discussions I've had with people I've interviewed as part of my study. But the tools are there to help local government bring in, bring in um, the local enterprise partnership and the health and wellbeing board so that they can work together. OK, there are statutory tools that enable this. It's just I'm not convinced at this stage that everyone is aware that these statutory tools exist. So there's a Local, Localism Act, which has many faults, which we won't go into here, but it does provide a general power of competence, which allows local authorities to think creatively, imaginatively, and work alongside communities and other bodies to bring them together, to create that space, um, to actually form local plans. The Health and Social Care Act, which was the catalyst for health and wellbeing boards, actually makes a priority the social determinants of health. So thinking about housing, thinking about education, th these are the things that should be prioritised before any plan is considered. There's the Social Value Act, which actually places this responsibility upon um, service commissioners to actually consider that any service that they commission, any plan that they undertake to actually evaluate its economic, social, environmental wellbeing value to actually consider that. There's the Equality Act, which actually does place a responsibility for all of these bodies to reach out to communities and involve communities. And also there's a national pl planning uh, policy framework, which local authorities do work with on a day-to-day, week-by-week, year-by-year level. And it clearly states that economic, social, um, and environmental objectives should be considered in all planning. So what is governance? Governance has a significant history. It developed in the late 1960s, 1970s uh, USA with discussions around corporatism, pluralism, um, and pluralism, a, a slightly different discussion because of the way that the Washington set up with federal governments and et cetera, et cetera, but moving over to a more marketized climate where business is involved 
in the um, in policy creation and policy implementation. So it's actually thinking about um, who is involved in this, what is their power, what is their responsibility, who is involved, are they involved to the detriment of other people. The policy network analysis field really took built up ahead of steam uh, during the later 1970s and early 1980s and looked at um, the UK government's relationship with um, other private bodies and with community community involvement. It, it was heavily criticised and much maligned really for just doing no more than developing a set of typologies and being at times too optimistic that the role of private enterprise could bring around benefits for just normal everyday citizens. Um, this led into other forms of um, governance studies, such as governance network studies, which looks more at horizontal relationships. This happened because of the sheer proliferation of networks now at regional and local tiers, whether it's bin collection, street cleaning, education provision, prison services, the market is involved in pretty much every, uh, every aspect of day-to-day -day life. So actually looking more at the horizontal relationships and looking at who they exclude, who they include, why they include them, why they exclude some individuals and not others, but also um, <clears throat> really considering how we can make local networks um, operate and function for all. I mean, governance in, in essence, um, touches upon all of these things. Um, so particularly around sort of autonomy, this is one of the prevailing sort of discussions in network governance literature, how autonomous are, net, are these uh, networks from central government? What I'm particularly interested in at the local level is how accountable they are, transparent, responsive, and how they, how they um, encourage participation, not just from third sector or voluntary sector bodies, but actually just, just community members, how people have channels to have some sort of say and some sort of political engagement at the local level. This is now moving on to my study, only a few slides left. These are the key questions I'm asking. Is policy implementation at the local level congruent with national policy objectives? So my study is really focusing now on what's happening in Sandwell. Does this align to what central government is saying. In order for me to do this, I've had to actually kind of like scope and scan and really bottom out the whole raft of documentation. The amount of reports and documentation from central government is just absolutely profound. What I've had to do to make sense of the documents initially is categorize them as, as national documents, regional documents, and more local ones. But to understand the relationship at the local level, with that, that with the state. The second question, just really interested to know who's involved in the decision making and how data is kind of like collected, how it's gathered and how it's shared. If there's one thing, oh, I'm pretty sure I knew this before my study started, but I certainly know it now. There's a whole raft of data. I mean, Sandwell NBC was one of the kind of like trailblazers with trends data. So Sandwell NBC itself has got its own department, which publishes trends data. There's a whole raft of this stuff. And obviously you can go into low, lower super output areas and just see exactly what's happening at the, the socioeconomic impact at a street level. Because there's such a plethora of data in, in the two bodies, I'm just interested to see what parts, what, what parts of this data are accessed. What's the narrative around the data, how it's used, and how that then defines objectives, which then leads me on to the final question, which is around policy framing. So how are local problems in Sandwell? How are they interpreted? So how do um, LEP board members, for instance, interpret the key problems taking place in Sandwell? So the data tells us what those problems are. What do they really think is the best response to those problems and similarly with the health and well-being board and in that policy framing process I'm just interested to know how power is used or how power is diffused and actually how local people and um, local agencies uh, what part they play at an empirical level for for my research i've adopted um, I've had to manipulate, but I've adopted 
um, a new government's framework, which was developed by Cligian and uh, Copper Jan, because the three core aims of this um, of their um, new new government's framework, quite by accident, I didn't design my questions around this framework. I found the framework after I devised my questions. So almost like it just fell into place, like a, a jigsaw puzzle really perfectly, is the substantive complexity. So that certainly links with my question too, around perceptions, objectives, strategic complexity, um, <clears throat> who is involved, who isn't involved. And with question one, the institutional complexity, just looking at the relationship really between local elites and local people of power with the state, and just to see if that has any kind of um, inherent influence. My study is a qualitative case study. So the context is Sandwell, devolution, um, austerity, and um, yeah, everything that's going on in the world today. But I'm focusing on Sandwell, looking at the two boards. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's an embedded case study with, with, with two embedded points which are the um, Health and Wellbeing Board and the Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, I'm doing a document analysis of the documents, so national, regional and local documents. Um, the sampling that involved me just, just approaching people, and it's been, I will not lie, that, that itself has been really quite a challenge because you're approaching people out of the blue. So it's, in, it's involved me reaching out to people in the third sector, um, health and well-being board members and local enterprise partnership members. I wouldn't have got as far as I have without the support of um, the local public health team. They've been absolutely fantastic and um, I, I very quickly reached saturation point with data collecting with the health and well-being board and the local public health team. They, they really they really said, you know, this, this will help us. This, this has a potential to really help us and we welcome the study. Um, with the third sector, again, um, they, were, they were really accommodating and uh, I've undertaken you know, a number of interviews with key players in the third sector. It has been more of a challenge with people from the business sector, but very, very slowly um, I've made some headway and I'm almost at the point now of saturation. Um, I've undertaken only 21 interviews, but in my wildest dreams, I never envisaged I would get that far, to be honest with you. I've undertaken semi-structured interviews, which generally last between an hour, an hour and 30. Um, I've used Teams, Microsoft Teams, um, which has been really, really helpful. I didn't realise until a couple of days before my very first interview, it's my colleague, Susie, who actually said, you know, you can actually get a transcript from this. It does it all for you. So I just felt so lucky to be able to do that. So that's been a, a, an absolutely incredible help. I'm using Envivo to org organize and just arrange some of the data. It still needs me to um, go and draw out themes myself. I mean, to the point of distraction, I'm continually going back to the data and seeing what it tells me and trying to map that against the empirical framework, the new public governance framework, just trying to make sense of it really. With the documents, it's been a little bit more easy uh, and, and more manageable because they tend to be written in a similar language and they, ad they adopt a similar language. <coughs> and even where they conflict, the language is very much the same, but you, you, you kind of, the, the more you become entrenched in, in, in and more familiar and build a relationship with the documents, I find that more easy. What I've learned is with the interview um, data, that's far more complex because people, articulate in different ways. And when you're listening to someone, you're interpreting their interpretations of their day-to-day -day experiences of working as part of these boards. I've also structured in um, a theoretical framework and I have to tell myself not to be too sidetracked by this. Because the data will not be generalizable at a numerical level because it's a case study. So I won't be able to generalize in the way that a more positive sort of, positive sort of piece of research would. Um, what I'd like to do is perhaps illuminate the findings more and link it to um, a deeper theoretical sort of analysis. I'm using um, Lader's adaptive theory, which I found completely by accident. But as soon as I started reading these, rather old dusty books. It made sense to me because of its sheer adaptability. Um, 
it's help it's helping me make sense and link the empirical with sort of like um theory certainly around um structure agency debates and Gideon structuration i've not completely got my head around this and i, I wouldn't want to sit here um giving a perception that i'm really confident that this is going to work but it's certainly my intention that the effectiveness of or my ability to complete my phd does not rest on this but i'd feel incredibly disappointed if i wasn't able to link the research beyond the empirical so beyond the use of the framework and perhaps link it to some sort of like deeper sociological theory this is the structure of my thesis without a shadow of a doubt it's going to change because in my mind i'm continually thinking i'm one of those people who wakes up at stupid o'clock thinking about how my thesis is going to look it will not look exactly the same as this i'm torn between different approaches really but for me the biggest challenge was starting to write um to write something that i felt fairly confident with so it was beyond looking like something you know a child with a crayon might put together to get me into the habit of reading absorbing information and writing it's always been a challenge for me from when i first did my um, access course you know, i came into education late and i think it was something that will always be a challenge for me um, so it was more important for me just to write and what i attempt to do is just write 300 words a day i just write daily and that was more important so i'm less bothered about the structure at this stage i've written um workable material i've only done 45 40 47 approximately 47,000 words so i've got hell of a long way to go but i am I'm, I'm not as intimidated by the thought of writing as i once was and i didn't want to allow those in a in a that inner dialogue with a, regarding the structure of my thesis to prevent me from writing it was just more important for me just to write read write read write just to continue doing that ah finished yeah i've waffled a little bit so i do apologize but anyway yeah i've finished so i'll stop sharing and if anyone's got any questions certainly be anything i haven't made any clear i apologize for that and i'll take any questions thanks warren so much for explaining this complex issue with such fluidity and also it shows your passion your hard work everything and i'm sure this will be fantastic for anyone even starting their research journey this is absolutely fantastic yeah as warren said any question um and yes um i really applaud you for this presentation as well so thank you so any question, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. Um, so Christina first. Thank you. I was trying to look for the 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 right the the hands and 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 somehow I couldn't find it. So I decided to do it <laughs> directly. Um, thank you, Warren. Uh, it is great because I actually been hearing a lot about uh, Warren's PhD without really knowing what was your PhD about, <laughs> apart from the title. So this is this is um, suddenly giving me um, a much more clear idea of, of of what you are what you are, are doing, and I think is is um, brilliant. It, it looks like super interesting, and I guess my questions I have. I've been taking notes um, and I would definitely like to talk to you more about in in, in, in Adidia yeah, because um, there's so many questions that I have and, and I don't want to take all the all the time. Uh, so um, I guess that the main question that I have is uh, you are using documents and this is just to to help me understand what you're trying to do, right? Okay, so you are using documents and you are using interviews. I could see that you have three questions, which I don't know whether those were uh, your research questions. Is that right? Okay, so um, so I have so so for me, I guess that I was confused in the sense like, is it something that what you are trying to do is to um, uh, distinguish what policymakers or what is being said in documents compared to what is being done 
in practice? Is that something that, and, and if that was the case, because I couldn't, I couldn't see from your research questions, uh, because for instance, the first question that I have, like is policy implementation congruent with national policy? I wonder why is the is and not the how, because that was going to give you a yes or no answer rather than how is it really, how both of them relate. And, and also whether are you looking at policy discourse, have you been analyzing the policy discourse in the documents and then compare it to the policy discourse of people that you're interviewing, or is it more about what they say they do compared to what they do? So if you could just explain, yeah. It's the, it's, the, it's the latter. I mean, fundamentally, I'm treating the kind of like um, the documents that are generated by central government as state apparatus, as, as directives, as guidance. This is what should take place at the local level. But I'm aware just for, for my engagement with the um, governance networks and policy networks literature, that those messages often become dissolved. And that because the, the, the involvement of so many different markets and so many different key players and key actors now at the local level, they have some ability to be flexible with those messages or interpret those messages in different ways. This is difficult. So using empirically, using the new public governance framework allows me to establish in some way that the, the, beyond the context of those messages, the strength of those messages and how those messages are interpreted and acted upon at the local level. Because government, government is basically just saying, this is what we want to happen in communities. Here you go, go and do it. The messages are so open to interpretation. So what that's involved me doing is, is actually assessing, doing a document analysis of the uh, regional, but more so the local documents, and just seeing how they stand up, stand next to the central government uh, narratives. But it's difficult. This has involved some of the um, some of the interviews as well. And what I didn't say actually, and what I should have said, I've also scrutinised um, board minutes, all minutes for health and wellbeing boards, all minutes for local enterprise partnerships are in the public domain. So it's actually looking at how those documents are interpreted, how they're used, how they're acted upon um, at those meetings as well. But to confuse this even more. This is one of the one of the questions asked because there's lots of sub questions in my interviews. I don't know if I'm about am I answering your question first. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that for me it was like in your presentation, you were talking a lot about how are things done, but then I could not see how in your research questions. Ah, and, and then I wonder whether that was you are going to need to type those things up because otherwise it kind of like seems that you are answering different questions. Right. Um, I mean, that is one of the criticisms of the questions. I just haven't got around to changing them yet, but I, I, I'm mindful that the questions might change slightly. It is um, an explanatory case study and they should use more how questions. OK, I mean, yeah. So that's something I have got to come back and have a look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, in, in essence, that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at and just through the interviews I've had with people as well. Um, just looking at how how these meetings. I've got the I've got the um, the meeting minutes, but actually looking at who holds the position of power at the meetings, who who talks more. So it's actually kind of like trying to establish and wait who has the most say at the um, at these meetings. So it's all of this, and it is incredibly complex. Trying to make sense and getting these strands of data to talk to one another. Yeah, it is complex. But yeah, I think you do raise a good point, how because how is definitely you know, a key part of it. And I'm sure, Warren, you will come back to share your findings in, in next year, some sessions, and then we can uh, raise these questions again. No, thanks. Thanks, well, Warren. One of the points I wanted to make, so I think Christina, what Christina has highlighted really, which is really skillful of Christina, is like perhaps one of the most complex parts of the study. Um, it, it is. And what I've found is just to make it even further complex, when I've spoken, everyone I've spoken to, one of the questions I asked them is, what are the key documents? What are the key documents that guide you? Pretty much all of them. Public health will say it's the Marmot stuff, the key Marmot reports, which the, gu the guidance dovetails to. But people from um, 
the local enterprise partnerships? None. They're not really familiar with any of the key guidance or documents. This is what they say. But they talk to them in the meetings, but they don't really know the names of the documents. So that's made it further confused. I always imagine before I interviewed people, they'd say, it's this, is the industrial strategy. It's the local economic plans. They would actually say, this is the key document we work to. But most of them say, well, no, I don't really know any. Thanks, Warren. I will go to the next question from Linus. Yeah, just wanted to say thank you very much, um, Warren. I could see you are so passionate about it. It came through and through and through. And actually it made me um, want to ask just something maybe simple, but fundamental, because uh, I used to work in Sandware. And um, one of the things, one of my observation obviously from your your presentation is the, I just wanted to ask something around the educational aspect um, because um, we did find that um, poor attendance um, in, in Sandwell is, is a big problem from um, uh, obviously the children and obviously and their families. And one of the contributive factors is that parents themselves have got very low um, educational attainment and just wanted to find out if that that is being recognized at the policy making level and if it's it, it is you know what are they doing about it or you know have you had any observations around that because i remember tony blair's speech when he was uh, in in the government then he emphasized the need for education he said education education, education three times to emphasize the importance of education because it can contribute to the economic growth, isn't it? So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that, um, Warren? That's, that's a big, thank you, Linus. That's, that's, that's a huge question. I'm not gonna to, I'm not gonna to, to do that justice. What I would say is, I mean, there was a report, if anyone is not um, familiar with it, Priestley did the English journey in 1930. He stops in West Bromwich. He talks in West Bromwich because Sandwell was created, you know, the local government stuff, when the West Midlands was created in the early 1970s. He stops in West Bromwich. And while he's visiting a local industrialist, some, some youths start throwing stones at the windows and breaking the windows. And he walks out of the building. The youths have run off. But he did see some kind of like 1930s, you can imagine, sort of some, some grubby faces throwing stones at the windows and they run off. And he actually says in his account of West Bromwich at the time, he said he would like to bring ministers and key leaders down from government, bring them to West Bromwich so that anybody who devises a policy from Westminster can see what life is really like in West Bromwich. And he actually says, he said, if all of the children came out onto the streets and broke all of the windows, he wouldn't blame them because life was so bad there. The reality is that Sanwell has been dealt a tough hand, like the, like much of the black country have. And yet historically, and this is what history suggests and this is in the literature, that the people who've been involved in the planning for Sandwell have not been Sandwell people. They're not people from the black country. They wouldn't be able to tell you the different areas of the black country. They have no knowledge of the people, its culture or its socioeconomic wellbeing. So I think in the absence of people caring, it's a kind of like um, that sort of, you know, level caring for the area then poor econ poor educational attainment is, is almost like symptomatic of that i must add that the most recent data which was published by the lep suggests that in sandwell young people's educational attainment is much improved and it's more aligned with the national average but that's not the case with um adults and older people yeah Sorry, Elaine, do you mind if I take Levy's um, question first, because we don't have much time. And thank you. Um, Levy, your question to Warren or statement. OK, Raise, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, Warren. I find your topic very, very interesting. It's like entering into a boxing ring with Mike Tyson, really. But let me say this. Um, maybe I could have missed it because my internet is a bit poor. So. My question is, you said something about um, 
instructions coming from the, you know, from Westminster to local government and then local governments interpreting them the way they want and so, and so forth, their own interpretation. But I wanted to ask you this question and say, would you think that the relationship that is there between Westminster and local government is like somebody who says, you can paint this room any color you like as long as it is blue. Would you say is that type of a relationship? That is, that is a fascinating question. That's a really good question. I mean, there's a long history of central government trying to serve, can navigate um, local government, particularly, you know, following um, Margaret Thatcher coming into power. I mean, she had an open disdain for local government. Before I started my study, I will say that I believed that local government has had far less power than what I currently believe that it has. It, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, yeah, I've still got to get my head around that. But from my interviews, it still seems that local government has some weight of power. Now, whether that weight of power is steered politically or whether it's in the interests of particular key actors, I wouldn't like to say it because I'm, I'm just at the, the, the onset, really, of my data analysis. So I don't know. Um, Levy, to be honest with you, that's a really, really interesting question, and it's one that in two years' time I'd like to be able to answer when I discuss Sam well. I honestly don't know. What I've realised is through the course of my interviews and looking at the documentation, the relationships between local government, the LEP and the Health and Wellbeing Board and the public health professionals and with the third sector is really far more complex than I ever imagined. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't give you any more information. It's very, very complex, but there's evidence of state steering because certainly um, the, st the state can, can, can provide rewards and sanctions, access to funding streams, almost make actors, actors being organisations or individuals, jump through hoops. And that's probably like a lot of relationships that we experience ourselves. So as central government, regardless of what it says at this stage about levelling up, he still firmly has some sense of control. I do believe that. Thanks, Warren. Thank you. Last but not the least, Elaine, your question very quickly. <laughs> okay, so, well, I did have two questions and then I sort of had two questions and a comment, Warren, so it was getting worse. So I'll just say very quickly, I mean, I thought the question from Levy was interesting because my PhD is also social policy and, um, I think it's really interesting that balance of power and who holds the power um, but also whether what is seen as government policy and then the way it's implemented is seen as implementation failure or simply implementation i.e interpretation of policy at a local level that fits local need and i think that's i actually thought that was one of the more interesting um things about social policy so i had two quick questions I think one's much quicker to answer than the other one so i'll tell you both questions but you probably will only answer the first one the first one was what's the most interesting thing you've actually found or discovered in your own research so far i just don't think about it loads just answer that question and because i think that would be interesting in itself and the second one was uh, really about are you going to integrate or how are you going to use the current social care ag agenda um, around well-being so for example you know the people people at the heart of care white paper or the leveling up white paper or are you not have you drawn a line under those under what you're looking at now because we're already there okay second one first i've drawn a line under it because all of this stuff has been published around the social determinants of health um and <laughs> I just, it, 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 it concerns me that that isn't used enough. I became really interested when there's a few social work articles saying that, why aren't we using this? Because it's built upon years and years and years of research. This is what human beings need access to. And I think everything else that's scaffolded on top of that just kind of um, almost kind of negates its importance. I mean, the World Health Organization uses the social determinants of health. Our public health um, body use it. I just, I'm fairly passionate about making people aware of that. What we do know is, is if either, even as to first year students, we get them to look at the Gini coefficient. And since the demise of New Labour and the onset of the uh, Libcon government 2010, you see that the disparity between those at the top and those at the bottom. And that's, that's a, a real stark reality in places like Sandwell, which really has very, very little affluence. Now, the first question, I've forgotten. Can you? I, I can't answer it. Can you just ask me that again? Yeah. 
was what was the most interesting thing you've actually found as part of your own research, not reading other Great question. Yeah, thanks. No, like, that's a good question. It is that I, I had, because I've got my own, uh, we've all got bias. I've got a deep, deep set bias about my area and feeling passionate about my area. I always imagined that when I spoke to people from the left, that they would be a little bit sort of uncaring, not really care, and just kind of like be rather selfish business leaders. It's completely smashed that. I think every single person I've interviewed cares about the area. They care, but they see the problems in a different way and they see the potential responses differently. So you wouldn't be surprised to hear that a professional who's come, who works in public health sees the problems around general health and well-being, housing, education, etc. And someone from a business background saying we need to build a better economy. But if you look beyond the surface of that, what you find is even even the people I've involved, some really powerful people, business leaders, they understand the plight of people in the area. They just got a different way to answering those questions, but they care. Everyone I've interviewed, I've been actually quite taken back with their passion. I've not interviewed anyone that doesn't have an understanding of the conditions in which people are situated. It's just that their response is different and it makes me feel more passionately about you know, my, my study, actually trying to create some sort of tool to get these bodies working alongside each other and sharing information and also influ influencing each other's perspectives just to build a better area. Thanks, thanks, Oren. I wish we had more time to discuss and we can discuss it for another one hour, but we are uh, yeah, um, over time now. So thank you, Oren, again for this fantastic presentation and thanks everyone for your contribution, questions, and uh, it is really a good discussion and I enjoyed, I, I hope that you all enjoyed as I did. So yeah, bye for now, thanks.